But today, we have our own Alan Falkham, who most of you know for the uh, superlative job he did on the retrospect, Nashville's uh, collage, almost of uh, all sorts of interesting things. That I don't know how he unearthed so much, but it was uh, every, every month I would just sit down and read it. These big pages that were like the old newspaper. Well, today he's going to uh, tell us about the report on Larry Britton, and I'm sure many of you remember him. Alan? Yeah, thank you. Hi. Thanks, everyone, and thank you, Gene, for the very kind introduction. And thanks to the Nashville History Club for having me back here. Um, today I'll be presenting true crime stories covered by reporter Larry Brinton. For those of you who don't know, Larry was a well-known local news reporter. He was hired by the Nashville Banner in 1955 to write obituaries, mainly because he had learned how to type in the Navy. <laughs> Within a year, he was assigned to the police and fire beat. Brinton would go on to become an award-winning investigative journalist, reporting on some of Nashville's most famous crimes, such as the Marsha Trimble murder and the killing of Grand Old Opry star David Stringbean Aikman and his wife Estelle. This is a photo of Larry from that case. It shows him calmly waiting while police divers search a nearby pond for evidence, evidence that Larry already has in his possession. <laughs> because the killers had confessed to him uh, the day before. You can see one of them handcuffed in the background walking. That gives you some idea of how far Larry would go to get the scoop on the Tennessean, which was his rival newspaper here in Nashville. Brenton would eventually rise to the managing editor position at the Banner, leaving in 1979, after 24 years, when ownership of the paper changed. He immediately started working as a television reporter for News Channel 5. Most people today remember him from the TV reporting. He worked 22 years at Channel 5, retiring in 2001. On the occasion of his retirement, Frank Ritter, who worked at the Tennessean, wrote, competing against him was a young reporter's nightmare. I estimate he scooped me 70% of the time. <laughs> Larry and I were never bosom buddies, even though we worked side by side in the press room at the police station. But I watched him closely, and I learned more in a month than you can in a year at journalism school. In the same article about Larry's retirement, Ritter quoted a mutual friend as saying, I can't see Larry sitting at home and doing nothing. Believe me, he's got something up his sleeve. We haven't heard the last of him, not by a long shot. Well, he was right. Soon Larry went back to work, this time for WSMV Channel 4, <laughs> reporting there until 2008 when he retired yet again. In 2009, my company launched the Nashville Retrospect, which was a monthly local history publication in the form of a broadsheet newspaper like this, which Jean mentioned. In it, we republished decades-old stories and articles from Nashville newspapers. After just a couple of issues, Larry contacted me, because I was the editor, saying he really enjoyed seeing his old stories in the paper again. Then, unsolicited, he started emailing me new stories. <laughs> Larry was 80 years old at the time. In a column we called Reporter's Notebook, Larry revisited many of the stories he covered in his career, digging up new information and reporting what had happened in the decades since. From 2009 to 2017, Larry wrote 94 stories for the retrospect. You see a few of them here. He also wrote historical articles, not just about stories that he covered personally, but uh, historical crimes. Uh, today I'll be presenting lesser known stories by Larry that appeared in the retrospect, not his more famous ones, 
like the Janet March murder or the cash for clemency scandal. The reason is that Larry himself talked about these stories in an interview I conducted with him in 2018, and which you can hear in two podcasts available online for free. Just go to NashvilleRetrospect.com and click on the podcast button. While you're there, click on the store button as well and look for the infamous murders sampler set, which contains four issues of retrospect newspapers that feature true crime stories by Larry. I have a few of them up here if you can't wait uh, to order it online. Uh, in it is the um, Paula Herring murder, the String Bean murders, the John B. Milton murder, which is known as the Samurai Sword case, and uh, one other that's slipping my mind. The Perry March, uh, Janet March murder. Uh, in my interview with Larry, he also discussed stories that he didn't write about for the retrospect, such as the Haney Gurley murder mentioned earlier, and the Marsha Trimble murder. So I highly recommend listening to the podcast. Seriously, it's much better to hear Larry tell these stories. Today you'll have to settle for my telling of these other stories, but I do have additional information and photos that, not, that did not appear in the retrospect. And one final opening note, Larry covered some truly horrible cases. So before proceeding, I want to warn you that I will be giving descriptions of violent crimes. This is the first story Larry sent me. It took place at the Tennessee State Penitentiary. Here's Larry's opening paragraphs. There's not much I haven't seen in reporting news for a half a century in Nashville and Middle Tennessee. That was especially true in the 1950s and 1960s while I was a police reporter for the Nashville Banner. I covered hundreds and hundreds of murders over those years, stepping over and beside victims' bodies just like homicide investigators. Some of those gruesome cases I'll never forget. One of the strangest occurred in 1958. I was at my desk at the police station's press room early one afternoon when I received a phone call from Lynn Bomer, warden of the Tennessee State Prison in West Nashville. So Larry goes on to write that he had gotten to know Bomer because he was the only reporter who would attend early morning executions at the prison. Larry refused to witness the electric chair killings, saying it wasn't his thing. He usually sat with the families and he found it awful that guards and prison officials could eat breakfast immediately afterwards. On this day in 1958, Bomer told Larry to go upstairs to the records office and pull the file on a prisoner named Paul Payne. This is the file Larry found. Notice that it's an escape record. Payne had been incarcerated in 1937 at age 19, then escaped the penitentiary in 1939. The Chattanoogan was part of a gang of teenagers dubbed the Baby Bandits, who were all captured after leaving, as this photo caption put it, a trail of crime through Nashville and five states. Payne was convicted of attempted bank robbery. So Larry took notes from the record and returned to Bomer's office, still not knowing why he was there. He eventually accompanied a group of law enforcement officials through the inside gates to the prison's metal shop. There, standing in a small shower stall, was a prisoner holding a jackhammer. He was ordered to proceed digging up the concrete floor. This was Larry's front page story. He reported that the skeletal remains of a person had been unearthed beneath three inches of concrete and two feet of dirt. You can see bones being collected in a box in the lower left of this picture. Larry opened his 1958 story with this. Three old time state prison inmates who are believed to have witnessed the murder of a fellow prisoner in 1939 were taken to county jail cells early today as protection against further prison violence. These witnesses claim to have seen Two prisoners hit Payne over the head and then strangle him. One claimed to have witnessed Payne's burial. Different prisoners gave different reasons for the murder. Payne owed money he refused to pay back, or he got in a fight over a craps game, or he uncovered a prison dope racket. 
It seemed like the prison mystery had been solved, but there was a problem. Payne had fillings in his teeth and the skeleton didn't. Then a new tip suggested the remains could be that of James Hannah Carn, a trustee who had vanished from the prison in 1944. Karn was known as the Icebox Bandit because when he robbed Nashville area H.G. Hill stores, he forced employees into the refrigerator. But apparently his description didn't match the skeleton either. The grand jury was asked to indict a certain former prisoner for murdering Payne, but they didn't because they weren't even sure who had been killed. Larry ended his retrospect article by writing, both Payne and Karn are still listed as escapees on prison records. In July 1963, two Metro police officers pulled over a car they suspected of being involved in a hit and run accident. The men in the car pulled guns on the two officers, disarmed them, and sped away. They quickly abandoned their car, went to a random house, and tricked a young man there into giving them a ride. The suspects got away using the victim's car with him still in it. The young man was later released by the gunman in Memphis. Now, this was a big story at the time, and the Tennessean went all out, publishing photos of the suspect's abandoned car, the victim's wife's neighbors, and the scene where the officers had been disarmed, which was on Hillsborough Road at Golf Club Lane. They even drew a map of the, of the escape route. Now, the banner had already been published that day, which was a Saturday, and the banner didn't publish on Sundays. So unfortunately for Larry, the Tennessean got the scoop. Not only did they have Sunday all to themselves, which was when this appeared, but they had Monday morning too because the banner was an afternoon paper. So on Monday morning, the Tennessean broke more news about the case, that one of the suspects had been captured and that the other had been positively identified by witnesses and by police using a mugshot. Here's how Larry opened his retrospect short story. <clears throat> James Moore Tidwell climbed out of bed early that Monday morning and headed to this kitchen for a cup of coffee and to read the newspaper. Seated at his breakfast table, Tidwell opened the paper and almost fainted. There on the front page was a photograph of Tidwell taken six years earlier after an arrest. Uh, Larry goes on to say that Tidwell later said his first inclination was to hide, but he knew they had the wrong man and he could prove it. He was a vacuum cleaner salesman who had been making calls in the Inglewood area the day, before, the day of the crime. So what does a person do, Larry wrote, does he take a chance on staying hidden and pray that police will discover their mistake? Or should he drive to the police station and turn himself in and try to convince officers that he's innocent? Maybe not. He's been identified in the newspapers as a dangerous man wanted throughout the Southeast. Would he be shot before he got a chance to tell his story? Larry would get a call that day from a lawyer friend asking him to come over to his house when Larry arrived, there was James Moore Tidwell, insisting that he had an alibi. Larry had his doubts because he had heard a lot of alibis over the years, and he couldn't believe the police would make such a huge mistake. So he asked Tidwell to take him to the people he'd talked to on his sales route, and Tidwell agreed. Whatever doubts Larry may have had, he knew he had a story, so he brought along Banner Photographer Vic Cooley. Here Tidwell sits with Mrs. Clyde Hardcastle and her daughter in the Hardcastle home. He was definitely here, she told Larry. Tidwell had demonstrated a vacuum to her between 5 and 7 p.m. on Saturday night, around the time the kidnappers were on their way to Memphis. That was enough to convince Larry, but they still needed to convince the police. At the Banner office, Larry explained the story to his editors. Pictured here is Larry on the right, and sitting at the desk is assistant city editor Pinkney Keel. They, were looking at, they are looking at Tidwell's mugshot. 
Larry telephoned police detective R.V. Owen, who was a close friend, and Owen came to the Banner newsroom and listened to Tidwell's story. Larry finally got his scoop, along with this picture on the cover. <laughs> the accosted police officers, the kidnapped victim, and his wife all had to admit that Tidwell did not look like the suspect. Well, maybe a little, but no. When the story broke, other customers called in to verify Tidwell's story. Now, you might be wondering why police even had a mugshot of Tidwell. I found a 1951 article about a man with the same name arrested for theft. But Larry wrote that in 1957, Tidwell had been accused of trying to, quote, blackmail women with fabricated information about their husbands. I don't really know what that means, but <laughs> those felony charges were dismissed. At the, same, at the time of the kidnapping, Tidwell's employer described him as the most conscientious, most ambitious, and hardest working employee he'd ever seen. The real kidnapper, who the Tennessean referred to as a fancy dressed gunman, was never apprehended. So I know Larry described the prison skeleton story as gruesome, but this next story is by far the most gruesome of his that I've read. It must have been one of Larry's first big crime stories. The victim was 20-year-old Willa Lee Norman. Her father, who lived in Elkmont, Alabama, is pictured here when he came to Nashville to make burial arrangements. The crime occurred on New Due West Avenue in Madison. I like to look up the locations of stories to get a better idea of where they occurred, but I had trouble finding New Due West Avenue. Turns out the name of the road had been changed to Due West Avenue North, which today runs roughly between Interstate 65 and Dickerson Pike. Here is Larry's opening for the retrospect story. A small group of Nashville police officers were standing near the trunk open trunk of a car when I drove up. I, it was parked in a gravel driveway of a two-story brick home on New Due West Avenue in East Nashville. It was a warm Sunday night, July 9, 1956. Visiting me were my brother-in-law, Archie Waldron, and his family of North Attleboro, Massachusetts. I decided he needed a little excitement. <laughs> We were cruising town in my personal car listening to the police radio calls when we heard an interesting radio dispatch. We turned around and headed for it. I pulled into the driveway and parked near some of the patrol cars, then walked over to where the officers were bunched together, almost whispering to themselves. One look into the car's trunk, and I understood why the grim-faced policemen were keeping their distance. There was a pungent, ghastly odor from a decapitated and dismembered body stuffed into two heavy paper sacks. Here is the cover story Larry would write. A man by the name of Milton Alred, whom Larry described at the time as a swarthy 22-year-old former mental patient, was indicted for murdering his common-law wife, Willa Lee Norman. Alred's father was out of town, and against the father's wishes, the couple were staying at his house with their 10-month-old son. One day, Alred came home drunk, and the couple got into an argument on the front porch, during which Alred said, Norman cut him with a pocket knife. He pushed her off the porch, over the retaining wall, and into the driveway, where he pounced on her, stabbing her in the chest with the same knife and killing her. After tending to their crying baby upstairs, he went back down to the driveway and dragged Norman's body into the garage. The reason Norman was referred to as his common-law wife is because he was already married and had two other children. His estranged 19-year-old wife told a reporter that after Alred had received shock treatments at Madison Sanatorium, he had bragged he could commit murder and then claimed to be crazy. She had been trying to get a divorce, citing threats by him against her and their children. 
District Attorney J. Carlton Loser would describe Alred as a sadist and sexually abnormal, which Alred denied while confessing to the murder. Here you can see a funeral attendant spraying chemicals onto the corpse, which had been in the trunk for two days in July. Alred's father had noticed the smell when he came home from vacation and called the police. You can also see the handcuff Alred explaining to police what he had done in the garage. Here's Larry's graphic description of that from his 1956 article. Quote, it was here in the garage, according to Alred's verbal statement, that he began the grisly task of dismembering the body, first with a single-edged razor blade and later with a heavy grubbing hole. Police said the woman's legs had been severed at the thighs, her head had been hacked from the body, one hand had been chopped from the wrist, one breast had been removed, and her chest and stomach had been ripped open. The body of the woman's unborn child was found in one of the sacks, police said. Medical examiners estimate the victim had been six months pregnant." End quote. The crime was so shocking it drew comparisons to past crimes. One was the 1949 murder of 14-year-old Marie Price, whose body was found on the banks of Mill Creek in Antioch. A photographer confessed to the murder found buried in his yard were jars containing parts of her. Another case was the 1941 murder of 69-year-old Walter Eubank, caretaker at Spring Hill Cemetery in Madison. He was bludgeoned by the estranged husband of Eubank's girlfriend. While unconscious, Eubank was soaked in gasoline, then set on fire. He woke up and ran through the cemetery, as one newspaper described it, a screaming human torch leaving a trail of burned clothes before collapsing. Now at first, Alred pled temporary insanity, but doing so meant that he faced the death penalty. He changed his plea to guilty and was given 99 years in the state penitentiary. Larry wrote that other prisoners called him razor blade for obvious reasons, but Milton Alred preferred another name Mildred. You remember that District Attorney Loser called Alred, quote, sexually abnormal. Well, in 1956, that may have merely meant that Alred was gay, because in 1974, he would make the newspapers again, this time for dressing in women's clothes in prison. Alred was also wanted, also wanted the state to pay for a sex change operation, but the state refused. Alred was granted parole after 29 years, but ended up back in prison after an assault conviction, ultimately serving 41 years behind bars. Alred died in a Watertown retirement facility in 2017, age 83. At the end of his retrospect story, Larry asked, after reporting on hundreds of murder cases over the years, why does the Milton Alred case stick in my mind? Well, I can think of a few reasons. <laughs> uh, in addition to witnessing such a grisly crime scene, Larry also rode in the police car with Alred on the way to jail so that he could interview him. Larry even testified at Alred's trial, none of which Larry mentioned in his retrospect article. But what was Larry's reason for remembering? Simple, he wrote, my brother-in-law, who tagged along with me on that fateful 1956 summer day, wouldn't let me forget it. Until his death, he recalled every detail of the murder and brought it up every time we talked. This next story is about a Nashville police officer, the man in the middle of this 1964 photograph. <clears throat> From Larry's retrospect article, Metro Police Lieutenant Fred Cobb Sr. joined the Old City Police Department in 1956 and retired after an amusing, controversial, and sometimes frightening career. 
Ask fellow officers who worked with Cobb for their thoughts about him and you'll get an assortment of answers. A phony, different, a pretty nice guy, a character, took religion too far, had no middle ground, killer, loved publicity, and more. All these descriptions are correct, so take your pick. Our, I'm sorry, uh, Cobb first achieved notoriety after becoming a downtown traffic officer who seemed to take a no one is above the law approach, giving traffic tickets to anyone no matter who they were. Here is Cobb on the right, standing with a General Sessions judge whom he had ticketed for not having a city sticker on his car. <laughs> the city attorney dropped the case the paper quoted Cobb as saying, I tried to do what was right. Another case involved the city comptroller who, while complaining to Cobb about the lack of downtown parking, used the word damn. <laughs> Cobb claimed he said, God damn. Because of the profanity, Cobb arrested the city comptroller for disorderly conduct, but the charge was thrown out. Cobb's comment to the newspaper, I just did what I thought was right. The Tennessean dubbed Cobb a one-man scourge of officialdom. <laughs> Cobb even gave tickets to his fellow officers. Here's a 1964 story by Larry about Cobb ticketing two meter maids illegally parked outside of a restaurant. From Larry's report, and to add the frosting to the cake, tra traffic officer Cobb casually ate lunch with the two meter maids <laughs> after issuing the tickets <laughs> and without informing them of what awaited when they returned to their scooters. <laughs> but it wasn't just parking violations that mattered to Cobb. From Larry's retrospect article, Cobb got a lot of attention in 1964 when he appeared as a federal court witness testifying against Morgan Smith, a rough and tough talking Metro police sergeant accused of income violations. Uh, Larry wrote, Cobb told the jury that Smith's reputation was, quote, would be that he has taken money from almost every law violator. Cobb also admitted that he had never seen the officer accept money. Smith was convicted and received a prison term. Now, given this story, it's a little tempting to think that we could use more cops like Cobb, but there's more. In 1956, Cobb was driving down a road in the Whites Creek area when he saw two stray dogs. He got out of his car and shot them, killing, killing one. The problem was they weren't stray dogs. They were on the property of their owner, a 14-year-old girl. Cobb apologized to the sobbing girl and her mom left and came back with a new puppy for the girl. However, when he noticed mange on the tip of the puppy's tail, he pulled out a pocket knife and cut it off. <laughs> At the time I did this, Cobb said, I thought I was doing right. <laughs> a year later, Cobb thought he was doing right again, but this time it would put him in the national spotlight. On a July Sunday in 1966, Cobb entered the Crescent Theater downtown and arrested the manager on charges of violating obscenity laws by showing the movie Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. Cobb also confiscated the, move, the film from the projectionist during the middle of a showing, then announced to the crowd from the stage that they should get a refund. What was so bad about the movie? The previous night, Cobb had taken his wife there to see the film. During a boozy argument scene, Liz Elizabeth Taylor says the words, God damn you. Cobb said the movie also made fun of evangelists like Billy Graham. It was a disgrace, he said. I couldn't rest easy without doing something about it. So the next day, Officer Cobb, who was a Baptist deacon and a Sunday school teacher, got a warrant and did something about it. I represent the thinking of the good people of this town, Cobb explained. I'm very sensitive about profanity. I know a man doesn't have the power to damn the Lord. I would like to see this film sent back to the West Coast or wherever it came from. 
The West Coast certainly heard about the case, along with the rest of the country, when the story hit the wire services. These are just a few of the national head articles. Though certainly newsworthy, I think some editors just couldn't resist the Who's Afraid headlines, which practically wrote themselves. Tennessean editor Harry Hahn said the national coverage was regrettable, writing, it is such inane furor that give fuel to the so-called Southern stereotype of being provincial and past tense. The particular injustice to Nashville is that this is not a community voice speaking. Rather, it is a self-appointed one-man censorship board who has taken it upon himself to talk for the community. In a matter of days, Police Chief H.O. Kemp dropped all charges and returned the confiscated film, saying that Cobb had made a mistake. It turned out the ordinance against obscenity cited by Cobb on the warrant only applied to live performances, not to movies. Interestingly, the original play version of Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf had previously been performed in Nashville a number of times without controversy, including in a church. <laughs> Despite this, hundreds of protesters showed up at Crescent Theater to show support for Cobb, who had become a mortal, moral crusader to many. Hundreds more came to see the movie, <laughs> some no doubt attracted by the controversy. Now, Larry notes in his retrospect article that Cobb did make some important and correct decisions while on duty. In one instance, he arrived as backup to help a fellow officer who had been shot at through a door while trying to serve a warrant. Cobb talked the gunman into giving himself up. And I found a 1960 article that credited Cobb with using a flying tackle to capture a man, a man he had seen assault a Fisk civil rights protester. That same year, however, 1960, a woman arrested by Cobb accused him of abuse and using, quote, police state tactics. She wouldn't be the last to do so. Over the years, Cobb made the newspaper many times for busting up illegal activities such as prostitution and selling moonshine. In 1967, he raided two places he suspected had illegal gambling machines. An article at the time reports, Cobb told the man at the door he wanted to search the establishment, and the man said he would not unless he had a search warrant. He tried to close the door on Cobb, and Cobb hit him. These places did have gambling machines, but the cases were dismissed because Cobb had no search warrants. It is behavior like this that would eventually have devastating consequences. In February 1981, Cobb was helping a fellow officer investigate a murder. Specifically, they were looking for a murder weapon. They, had already, they already had the suspect in custody. They even had a weapon, but they were looking for another weapon. In the pocket of the arrested suspect, they found a key to a hotel room in East Nashville. So the officers went there to have a look and came up empty-handed. But the hotel desk clerk said he had seen a man matching the suspect's description use another room. So he gave Cobb the room number and a pass key. The officers said they banged on the door and loudly announced they were police. When no one answered, Cobb, you, armed with a shotgun, used the pass key and opened the door, which was stopped by a latch chain. Through the narrow opening, Cobb saw a man in bed reach under the mattress and pull out a handgun. Cobb fired immediately, hitting the door chain and sending buckshot and shrapnel and metal fragments into the small room. The man was grazed by the blast and dropped the gun. Lying on the floor at his feet in the line of fire was a three-year-old girl who amazingly was not hit. The officer with Cobb said that had she should, stood up, she would have been killed. Unfortunately, the girl's mother did get hit. Linda Louise Sumler was found bleeding on the bathroom floor and later died at General Hospital. She had recently separated for, from her husband and was staying in the hotel room with her child 
one of four, and with her boyfriend, Frank Driver. Police admitted that none of them had anything to do with the murder that was being investigated by the officers. Nonetheless, Cobb, who said he had only fired in self-defense, immediately arrested Driver, who was charged with assault with intent to commit murder, after several hours, hours of questioning at the police headquarters. The victims in this case were black, and though Cobb's fellow officer, Walter Farmer, was also black, the NAACP and other African American community groups in Nashville protested the killing of Linda Sumler, primarily based on the fact that Cobb did not have a search warrant. Signs at initial protests read, Chief Casey hang Lieutenant Cobb high. Later protests would include shouts of Joe must go. The reason is that though Chief Joe Casey would admit Cobb had violated policy in not obtaining a search warrant, he also insisted Cobb had not committed a criminal act and claimed that having a search warrant would not have changed the outcome. Of course, that presupposes a judge would have granted a search warrant for a room that had nothing to do with a crime. The charges against Frank Driver were eventually dropped, but there remained a question of whether or not District Attorney Tom Shriver would ask the grand jury to indict Cobb for manslaughter. Shriver did ask the grand jury for an indictment, but after its own investigation, the grand jury declined. Cobb faced a disciplinary hearing for violating police procedure and received a 30-day suspended sentence without pay, a 30-day suspension without pay, which was about $1,850. That was his only formal punishment in the matter. Free from an indictment, Cobb asked to return to duty. Disappointed leaders of five black community organizations issued a joint statement saying, we regret that in our national community, the grand jury has found that Mrs. Linda Sumler was not entitled to protection from illegal search guaranteed to all of us by both the United States and Tennessee constitutions. The whole scenario of events may be interpreted as giving police a blank check and an open license to conduct illegal searches or illegal activity, sorry. Driver would sue the city and settle out of court. The Sumler family sued the city for a million dollars they were awarded $70,000 by the city council. Cobb would retire from the force a year later in 1982. Probably because of his high profile in Nashville, he decided to run for sheriff in 1990 and then for city council in 1991. He lost both races, garnering only 5% of the votes in his final run. Cobb died in 2006. Now, Larry ended his retrospect article there, but I found one other telling story about Cobb. The law seems to have caught up to him in 1991, at least a little. There was a piece of property off Brick Church Pike that for many years had been used as an illegal dump. A judge ordered Fred Cobb, who was 64 years old at the time, to clean it up. Why? because in the trash they found campaign literature from Cobb's failed sheriff run. The property, it turned out, belonged to a friend of Cobb's who had said he could use it. Cobb's cleanup plan involved burning some of the debris, but the fire got way out of control. A large cloud blackened the sky in the area, catching the attention of Metro Health Department. A bulldozer from Public Works had to be sent out to bring the blaze under control. Cobb was convicted of reckless burning and given a one-year suspended sentence and six months probation. The article quotes Cobb as saying, I was trying to do what I thought was right. <laughs> this final story is also the final story that Larry sent me. I like, and, and like the very first story he sent me, eight years earlier, he included a mugshot. It starts in Memphis on Christmas Eve, 1965. 
Marjorie Appleton, a 37-year-old divorcee with three ch young children, was found dead by the side of Interstate 40 near Brownsville, Tennessee. Her body had been dragged over a barbed wire fence and covered with leaves. An autopsy determined the cause of death was strangulation, not the 42 stab wounds on her stomach and chest. She had also been sexually molested. Police labeled it the work of a, quote, criminally insane person. Appleton had been a waitress at a restaurant, and her co-workers identified a person who had recently been spending time with her, a Nashville man by the name of Herman Dewey Batson. In his retrospect article, Larry described Bas Batson as a husky ex-Marine who was nice looking and intelligent. Larry wrote, Batson received a Purple Heart and a Bronze Star for his role in the 1st Marine Division in Korea. However, he went absent without leave and returned to Nashville in 1959. He was court-martialed and given a general discharge from service as opposed to an honorable discharge. Newspaper articles also described him as a 35-year-old, 6-foot, 200-pound former barroom bouncer who had taught judo and karate while in the Marines. When Batson's name and photo appeared in the press, a 25-year-old Nashville sec secretary named Joanne Withers recognized him. She had been on a date with Batson after they were introduced in a South Nashville bar. Later, while they were sitting in his car outside of a restaurant, he tried to kiss her. When she refused, he slapped her. She said, quote, then he took off his belt and tied my hands in front of me. He hit me on my left temple. The whole time he was beating me up, he was smiling. She fought back, managed to escape, only to be dragged back into the car by Batson. This time he tied her hands with a necktie, but, when she, but she managed to escape again. Batson gave up and sped away. This happened one week before the Memphis murder. A tip led police to a bar in New Orleans, and they found Batson sleeping nearby on, a blood, on the bloodstained seats of his car. He eventually admitted meeting Appleton at a Memphis bar. Though the two went bar hopping together and drank heavily, he denied killing her. He was indicted for first degree murder. Almost a year later, Batson was tried in Memphis. He stuck with his story, testifying that after drinking that night with Appleton, he blacked out. When he woke up in the car, she was dead on the seat next to him. He admitted disposing of her body, but claimed he didn't know how she was killed. The jury didn't buy it. Batson was sentenced to 99 years in prison. Legal maneuvering by his lawyer was credited with keeping Batson out of the electric chair. When the verdict was read, Batson said to his attorney, I think he did a good job. Being incarcerated in the state penitentiary didn't seem like much of a punishment for Batson, at least judging by the newspaper articles about him. And there were a few. It was as if he had a press agent. He was quoted and photographed for a Tennessean article about prison life, complaining that he had only received counseling twice due to lack of prison employees. He was featured in an article about the University of Tennessee Nashville's College Within the Walls program. The article says that inmates like Batson with exemplary records of behavior lived without res the restriction of locked cells. Batson, who had a perfect 4.0 grade average, said, you are not as conscious of being in prison as someone would be if they were not in the college program. He made the newspaper again in 1975, when he was one of the first two students to graduate from the prison college program. Batson earned an Associates of Arts degree with the highest honors. And that degree probably came in handy, because a year later, Batson was no longer in prison. He had served only 10 years of a 99-year sentence, when it was commuted by Governor Ray Blanton. If you don't know about the cash for clemency scandal, I refer you to my podcast interview with Larry, 
who was the investigative reporter who broke the story. It would lead to the downfall of Governor Blanton. At the time of this 1974 photo, Connie Munn on the far left was working as a dancer at Skull's Rainbow Room. She was still working there as a waitress in 1976 when she met ex-convict Herman Dewey Batson. She offered him a ride home. Larry wrote in the retrospect, on the way, the 33-year-old woman said she resisted sexual advances made by Batson. Then she said he tried to choke her and take her car keys from the ignition. Munn said she was driving on Nolensville Road at the time and luckily spotted a Metro police car. Batson, out of prison only months, was arrested, charged with assault with intent to commit murder, and jailed. Larry wrote that the arrest should have returned Batson to prison for violating his earlier release. It did not. Larry's research didn't turn up a reason why Batson was allowed to remain free. Larry also wasn't sure where Batson ended up next, but I found a 1978 article in the Memphis Commercial Appeal that filled in a small gap. After getting out of prison, Batson was eligible for Veterans Administration benefits, which he used to pursue a four-year degree in business, business administration at the University of Tennessee, Nashville by attending night classes. Why night classes? Because during the day he had a job at the university as the Director of Registration and of Veteran Affairs. Many are aware of my background, Batson said in the article, and it hasn't made any difference to them. The next records Larry found of Batson were in Knoxville at Pellissippi State Community College. Larry was incredulous, writing, Batson was hired at the State College in the late 1970s. His job was not janitorial or maintenance type work. This vicious murderer was handed the job as the state's colleges, as the college's registrar. Now how did that happen? Was it a top prison official, a politician, or maybe a lawyer who paved the way for Batson's college post? And how did he keep his criminal past so secret for so many years? Larry interviewed a Gary Lay of Knoxville who said, I'm shocked. We were the best of friends. He even gave me his shotgun and a pocket knife given to him by his grandfather. Lay said Batson never mentioned his violent past. Now earlier I showed you the mugshot that Larry sent me. He also sent me three other photos that he found in his research. They are all snapshots of Herman Dewey Batson posing with women in a bar. Batson died in 2016 at the age of 82. Memorials to him were posted online. The woman in this picture wrote, I know what a wonderful man he was. He was kind and generous and very funny. He used to tell me old marine stories. I'm so happy that he crossed my path in this life. I will carry him in my heart and in my laughter. Other memorials described him as a, quote, quite a character, approachable, a people person, helpful, a good friend, and a great man. But one memorial I found may have revealed a glimpse of the Batson from decades before. A coworker wrote, everyone he came in contact with saw the rough side of him, but also knew the soft side as well. He could take his fist and split a keyboard in half when things weren't going well. But then he would go around to everyone and give out candy with his boyish smile. Larry ended his article with this. There are the memories of just a few of those who knew Herman Dewey Batson in his later years. They never knew he slaughtered a waitress with a knife in Memphis or assaulted others in his hometown of Nashville. Now to me, this story, Larry's final story, really captured how much he enjoyed investigative reporting. He had interviewed people about Batson back in 1965, including Batson's mother. 52 years later, at the age of 87, 
Larry did so again to find the truth, to uncover facts no one knew, and to get another scoop on the story. I visited Larry at the retirement facility he moved into after the death of his wife, Rita. It was mostly small talk between us, but I, what I remember most is that he brought up this story. It was clear to me of how proud he was of it. Here is Larry in his home, in a room with walls covered in awards, newspaper clippings, and photographs of him with people ranging from presidents to celebrities to criminals. Larry said in our interview that he never should have taken the editor position at the banner because it took him off the street and away from newspaper reporting. I was very fortunate to have worked with Larry, even if it wasn't in the hustle and bustle, dog-eat-dog -dog world of daily newspapers. I like to think the retrospect gave Larry one more chance to do what he loved. He died on July 25th, 2019. Frank Ritter wrote in his article about Larry, no one could do the police beat, the cultivation of sources, the chasing down of news like Larry Brenton could. You never can predict what direction Larry's gonna come at you from to scoop you one more time. Thank you. I suppose there's a little time for questioning, if questions if anybody, I say questionings like I'm being interrogated. Yes, sir. I thought there was a real failure in police enforcement and the judicial system during that time. I mean, was that well, yeah, about that? I, you know, Larry wrote an article uh, for the retrospect called a Criminal Justice Way Back When, where he talked about some of that. And Larry saw police abuse. He wrote about it and talked about uh, after the bombing of uh, Luby's home, um, some p suspects were rounded up and Larry overheard that they were going to be given a lie detector test. And he thought, well, they, we don't have a lie detector. He knew they didn't have a lie detector. Well, he walked by a door where they were, had one suspect laid over a table and were beating him with a paddle, which was the lie detector. And they, of course, they never could, they were innocent. No, no one was ever convicted of, of those crimes. So, yeah, it was, I don't know how you would sum, it, sum up the, how it was, how, how, how iffy it could have been. To, yeah, definitely. I mean, there's lots of stories about that. Um, you know, that was, of course, that was 1980. That wasn't that long ago. And we hear stories like Breonna Taylor and I think it was Missouri, uh, Louisville, you know, similar thing where police bust in on a room they had no business being in. And so it's, it's not like that's gone away. Hopefully it's better. But, um, but yeah, it, it was, it was bad. Yes. Uh, share a, a personal story about Larry Brent. And this is he apparently was a person of many facets and good ones. Uh, I just remember watching him on TV. I don't remember his, his uh, days in the newspaper. But one time I was, I think it was about 2010, around the time when he had the uh, the big flood. I was waking up from surgery at a national hospital, and first thing I did when I woke up, I saw this smiling face leaning over me and said, well, are you feeling better now? Can I get you some magazines or whatever? And it was Larry Britton, and my wife, and I'm going, did I die and go somewhere? <laughs> this can't be him. He's just been out of circulation. I said, are you Larry Britton? I said, that's me. And he said, and I said, what are you doing working here? And he volunteered at St. Yep. Thomas West, uh, going around just talking with people, and I had yep. never seen that side of him, and I, I wasn't really a fan of him until that time that I became a famous fan after that, but he apparently was very gracious and, and liked being around people enough that he would volunteer in hospitals going yeah. around, as they used to call them, candy stripers. Right, and yeah, I think... So I think he would, did that for many years. Of, of he, some of his family is here and would know more about that. But yeah, he was, he was just a very interesting character. I mean, I like some of the stories that stand out to me was, well, the, the, uh, you need to listen to him tell the string bean case story because that is just, 
amazing. He got, he convinced photographer Jack Gunter to go swimming in this pond and find this satchel that had evidence. Now, they at the time had with them uh, Sherman Nickens with Metro Police. So they were doing under this, all under the uh, eyes of a police officer. So it's not like he was you know, tampering with evidence, but it was very iffy. Uh, he said they asked him not to do anything like that again. Uh, and he also tells the story of how competitive he could be where uh, the National Enquirer was in town and I think they were trying to cover Elvis at a hotel or something. At one point, they go into the hotel and while they're there, Larry went and let the air out of the car, the tires of their car <laughs> so that they could go somewhere else. So he was, he was very competitive, but at the same time, uh, he, uh, so, uh, he tells the story about, um, I think it was a cerebral palsy charity that um, there was some suspicion, suspicion about what they might be doing with funds. So he asked the editor, I'm, hey, should, I'm going to go investigate him. The editor said, sure. So he goes and investigates it, finds out his own editor was taking money from them and uh, reported it. And so the editor had to give the money back and uh, the, the charity got in a lot of trouble. So he wasn't afraid to, to reveal a lot of uh, information about even his own colleagues if, if it was part of the truth. Yes, ma'am. Uh, a friend of mine said to me that they didn't like Larry Britton and could never like him because when he was reporting on the Janet March killing, he denigrated her in the press. And I'm wondering if really he was just reporting what Perry <laughs> said to him and printing that. I don't know. He talks about the, uh, like I said, that story is included in this package up here. He did write about it, and uh, I think he was proud of the fact that he was able to stay connected to March, and so that he could get more information. I don't know about what he wrote. I haven't gone, I haven't read or, or, or watched the news reports from that time, so I don't know anything about that. But I do remember that when he switched to Channel Four from Five. Perry March told him, well, I don't like Channel 4, and Larry said, well, tough, you know, I'm not, you know, that's just too bad. So that broke off the relationship there. So. Well, I just watched your podcast. Oh, yeah. Oh. He said he always thought he was guilty. Yes. Yes. Yeah, and, and, he, and he's, he, he, he's mentioned a few things to me like that over the years. Like, I really wanted him to write about the Marsha Trimble case and the uh, Haney Gurley case, but he never did. But he, he did talk about it in the interview, so you can hear him at least say something about it. But I think he felt like those had been covered so well already by other media like Nashville Scene and, and, and the news and documentaries and books. I felt like he didn't think he could add any, anything to it. But I wish he had written about it anyway. There's probably a whole lot he could have written that, uh, in fact, uh, uh, someone uh, my friend Joel Dark pointed out he found an obituary for Jerry Thompson, who was a Tennessean reporter. And uh, he had one of his claims to fame is that he infiltrated the Ku Klux Klan and uh, reported on what they were doing, which turned out to be not much. But Larry went to a rally to report on the rally and saw and recognized Jerry Thompson there. Uh, but when he came back, he did not, did not use it as a scoop. He could have blown his cover and gotten a story for the banner, but he didn't. So he, uh, that's the kind of guy he was, I guess. Yep. Any other questions? All right, thank you very much. <laughs>